good, good, good. Well, um, welcome everyone. I can see um, animal protein is not exactly at the top of the list here at this particular conference. So my name is Cindy Daly. I'm actually from the Midwest, my folks farm. My family farms on both sides of my pedigree. I tell people I'm homozygous for farming because it's all my family's ever done. And uh, you know, it's a German Catholic family, six kids and only so much farm. So the rest of us have to go off and do something else, right? Mm -hmm. So my family's still farming there. My sister farms, my brother farms. My brother actually converted one of the family farms to organic uh, just recently. So that was pretty exciting for me. I consider that a personal victory. Yeah. Whereas my uh, sister is still farming conventionally and they run like 3,500 acres. So it's a pretty large operation. Yeah. And, yeah. What, what state are they Illinois. in? Illinois. They're in Illinois. Illinois. Yeah. Right. So I came west uh, to go to graduate school and uh, didn't leave. Um, went to work for UC Davis and uh, a few experiment stations and ended up at Chico. And uh, here um, I started an organic dairy program in 2006, which was a little controversial um, in the middle of Agland because um, North Central California is very steeped in conventional agriculture. Um, it's uh, a lot of orchards, there's some real crop, um, grazing land, a lot of grazing land, and the dairies are all conventional, as you know. It's the number one dairy state in the nation. Wow. Wisconsin doesn't like to hear that, um, but it's, it's true. And it's because we have these very large cable style dairies. Mm -hmm. So when we went um, organic um, with the school's dairy, it was a bit of um, an undertaking. And we, we got a lot of heat for that, but it really is a wonderful model that really fits our program well. It's only 85 cows. And it's a pretty intensive, we do an intensive grazing program, so these cows are all out on grass. And they're out on grass pretty much year round, except for the winter time. When it's raining like this, you know, we don't put them out there, because it damages the pastures pretty much. So we try not to, to, to have them out on grass when it's pouring down rain. Well, thank you, sir. <laughs> Yeah, speaking of yeah, the cowboy. So uh, anyway, we, uh, we, that program has actually been in play now for about 12 years. So we've managed to you know, withstand the test of time. And that program is really thriving. We have 12 students that are actually working on farm, learning intensive, organic, hands-on, about soil management, pasture, grazing, cows, milking, they milk the cows. They breed the cows, they mix, mix the ration, they do everything. <coughs> so it's, uh, it's been really quite um, successful and you know, with that, you're pretty much untouchable at that stage because now the dairy's making money where it hadn't been making money for many decades. Um, because a conventional model, 85 cows, you can see how that wouldn't fare too well. So I took a bleeding dairy unit that was conventional and we made it more profitable with an organic pasture-based program. Um, now come forward uh, to 2016, and um, we're faced with a lot of uh, you know controversy now at this stage. We're at that stage where we're out of time. We know that conventional agriculture needs to have a paradigm shift, and we really think that the universities need to be involved in that. Mm -hmm. And coming from conventional agriculture, I can say what I can say because I really know it. It's my people. It's my culture. I know what's going on there, and there's. Uh, much work that has to be done. We need to shift that paradigm more towards a regenerative model. So we started this regenerative ag initiative back in 2016, together with some like-minded faculty, some industry folks, some farmers, some philanthropic organizations, student staff. It's a big It's a big initiative that has a lot of people involved. And the idea is, is that you know we really need to get behind these more regenerative practices. So. Um, my talk today is a little bit about um, how regenerative practice um, is important to developing nutrient density in animal protein. Animal protein is kind of my area of expertise. Dairy, beef, cattle, um, that type of thing. Grazing ruminants. So what I want to do with this presentation is basically connect some of these dots, you know, between farming methods, the impact that these farming methods have on soil, soil health, <coughs> environmental health, and then ultimately on nutrient density of food. 
and I know all of you in this room, I'm preaching to the choir, you know, soil, you know, can certainly be our salvation. And I know everyone embraces that in this room, but we have a, you know, a whole populace out there that really doesn't get it. And where I'm teaching in the College of Agriculture, I consider that the bleeding edge, because a lot of those kids come from conventional agriculture, and for them, soil is nothing more than a medium just to hold up the plant. So the fact that, you know, that's a living, breathing organism is a real new concept for them. <coughs> it's a new concept for me, and it took quite a while for me to kind of work through that learning curve. So what we need to do is get them on that learning curve. So, you know, why now? Why do we need this initiative? Obviously, you know, we're at that breaking point. Ecologically speaking, we're at a breaking point. We're well past it. I mean, at this stage, I mean, the wildfires out in California, horrendous. We've never seen them so intense, so hot, so massive. And droughts, we're getting our share of those as well. And floods, you know, it wasn't a week after they put that fire out that we had three inches of rain. And threats, we had flooding, mudslides, you know, were a real threat. We've got a real ecological disaster on our hands. It's here, it's now, so we don't have any time to waste. So we think it's really important. Not only do we have, you know, this whole climate change issue, but, you know, we're burning through our soil at a pretty rapid rate. And these things just can't continue. So it's really not about sustaining agriculture. We're beyond that. That would be sustaining a degraded system. So our initiative, and like many others across the country, which I'm happy to hear about, it's about regenerating. So regenerative agriculture is about regenerating these resources, because we have to do that, or uh, it's game over. So our initiative. Um, is, is really a combination of folks. This happens to be David Johnson. He's New Mexico State. He's one of our adjunct professors, as is Tim LaSalle. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Tim. Um, but, but Tim's an adjunct as well, co-founder of the, our initiative. Um, and we're inviting Chris Nichols to join us as a part of our team. Can't think of a better member um, to be a part of our uh, consortium. Um, and our whole plan is to really attack this issue of regenerative agriculture on several fronts. We, you know, from applied research to really hit that hard and to get that information out there to the industry where it can be used. Educationally, we think it's really, really critical that we get this into the curriculums, not only in our program, but in programs across the country because that's our future. Those are our kids. And <coughs> no offense to all the folks that are um, social security age, but you know, oftentimes the kids are easier to change than, than the dads. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many times I've got kids that come into my class and say, you know, Cindy, I went home and I talked to my dad over Thanksgiving about some of the things you were talking about, and he said that that just won't work. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, you know, there'll come a time when you'll have to actually test that, that paradigm, and then you can come back and tell me whether or not it works. But in the meantime, you know, let's go see these places. Let's go see the Scott Parks in Meridian. Let's go see the Gate Browns in, in, in North Dakota. Let's go to some of these places where we know it is working, and then you tell me it's not working. And according to Gabe, and he was just out, well, he's part of our plan is to bring, you know, a farmer to farmer kind of mentoring program uh, to our area, to our region. In the middle of all those fires, we hosted the Soil Health Academy. You know, can you think of a better topic to, you know, right in the middle of needing to happen? Anyway, Gabe said you could do it anywhere. With any amount of rainfall, with any soil type, you know, these practices, they apply no matter where you are around the globe. And he's not the only one saying that. Roland Bunch wrote the book, Two Years of Corn. Um, he's phenomenal. Uh, this man has been around the globe um, farming in very, you know, difficult um, ecosystem and has been able to reclimate soil with his cover crops. His new article is coming out in our journal. You got to wait and see that. It's going to be a good one. Um, lots of uh, wisdom there that we're going to uh, hopefully bring to the masses through this new journal for regenerative agriculture. So what is regenerative practice? When I talk about this in my classes, I think a picture is worth a thousand words. So it's pretty simple. You know, we've got a degenerative type uh, vineyard on the left, and we've got a, a regenerative orchard 
a vineyard on the right. What are the <coughs> practices that you just see? What's glaring? Cover. Cover crops. Animals. Animal impact. Animals, <laughs> absolutely. You know, we're double cropping here. Yes. Um, what's wrong with this picture? Scorched earth. Scorched earth. Absolutely. You know the soil temperature there in California in the summertime? Do you know what our temperatures are in California in the summertime? It can be 105. It can be 110. And with that kind of soil, you have nothing to cover that soil. So you're baking all the microorganisms. And so if it were at any one time a living organism, it's not going to be after 110. So that's also chemical intensive. Correct. Uh, support system that has to be because it doesn't have the nutrients. Yeah. You don't see a weed there, do you? There's not one weed there. So that means that there's been tillage. That means that there's been herbicide. And in order then, you know, to sustain that, you're going to have to feed it. So with with fertilizers. So that kind of a scenario, the monocropping system really just opens up the door to pests. It's like you know building a smorgasbord for a certain type of pest and um, um, infections and and so on. So in order to circumvent that, you know, a more regenerative model is building in diversity. So putting in more diverse cover cropping having animals be your weed control, and also, you know, as they walk around this orchard, they're also depositing a lot of wonderful microorganisms. They're just kind of like a walking soil probiotic, making their deposits, you know, wherever they might be. So here, again, is another contrast between a degenerative system and a regenerative system. You know, here we're, we're breaking up you know, whatever, whatever biology might have been there is oxidizing and is releasing, we're losing a lot of uh, mycorrhizae. And over on this side, we've completely covered the earth and so it has a, its nice um, armor and uh, we've got uh, a way to, to try and prevent. Uh, is that soy? Yeah, yeah it's, it's like soy. Soy right in the middle of uh, corn, yeah, corn residue. Uh -huh. That's a beautiful thing. California is home to the largest uh, uh, walnut and almond in, in, in the world, um, and there is huge diversity there. We are now partnering with um, several um, RCDs. The Glen County one happens to be the most progressive. There are some really wonderful guys, producers, that are growing um, walnuts and almonds out there that are now using cover crops and compost and um, have have given us some pretty remarkable anecdotal data where they have reduced the amount of irrigations that it takes in order to produce a crop. They've also reduced their amount of inputs, which is also quite, um, when you decrease the amount of inputs, obviously the profitability is, is improved. And so over time, you end up with you know, soil that looks more like this rich, uh, dark cottage cheese as compared to something like that that doesn't have much aggregation, there's no porosity there, it's just a, a more difficult system. And in California, we also have a very diverse dairy industry. It's the number one dairy state. Well, we've got a lot of degenerative dairy systems there, and that particular uh, type of dairy production is basically imploding as we speak. Mm -hmm. We're losing a lot of producers. And it's the least cost scenario that we know is doesn't work um, in agriculture. And um, we're now at 10,000 cow dairies. If you're not 5,000 cows or above, you're pretty much on your way out. And if that doesn't cause an ecological impact, I don't know what would. And so then people are real surprised to know that we have all of these new regulations from the Air Resources Board and from the Regional Water Quality Control Board. We have some really heavy regulations, and that's why we have them, is because they are having a big impact. There are some people who cannot get permits to build creameries or dairies because their groundwater is 80 parts per million nitrate and nitrogen. Where did that come from? Well, you know, it comes from degenerative type agriculture. So it's not as if these regulations are not warranted. It's not as if these regulations are not needed, um, because they are. But who loses? Yeah. All the small producers who are trying to cover the costs on those higher regulations. These larger dairies that are 10,000 cows can really afford, uh, you know, to hire 
um, the consultants that it takes in order to, to do this. Our little dairy is 85 cows, and it cost us $20,000 to comply with the general order of 2007. Hey, if it wasn't state funded, if it wasn't the taxpayers of California, um, we wouldn't be milking cows there today. So um, it's pretty intense, um, but we brought it on ourselves. And <clears throat> this is the kind of model that we are, 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 are promoting. This is the kind of thing that we are after. And it's a more regenerative type model where the cows are doing what cows are supposed to do, and that is graze grass. That's how they're designed. That's how um, God intended. And when you look at the data, there's plenty of research out there that shows this is the kind of system where you create a net zero impact. <laughs> if you look at the carbon flux data, the greenhouse gas data, these cows offset that methane. They're going to produce methane. They're a ruminant. It's part of their biology. But that, those greenhouse gases can actually be offset with the benefit of those cows on a grazing type ecosystem. So when you take that cow out of an ecosystem, she is a net emitter. And she's a problem. But when you put her back into her ecosystem, she's now a positive. She's actually a net carbon sink. Um, same thing is true for the beef industry. I mean, we've got a lot of this out there. I don't have to name names. You probably know who they are. Um, there's a lot of cattle out on feed um, there in California because the weather is quite compatible um, with that. But we also have quite a grass-fed beef movement here. Not a lot of infrastructure to support it, unfortunately, because it's an industry that's basically at its infancy. And I'm really happy. And how many of you are producing grass-fed beef here? Great. <laughs> you eat it? So do I. <laughs> Same scenario holds true here. Um, you know, this is where cattle can actually be a benefit. And they, you know, um, are a solution to climate change. And, and here they clearly are not. So it's really a choice. It's, it's really a choice. It's not about the cow, it's really about the how. To coin a phrase. <coughs> All right, so here's where agriculture tends to be a problem. Our soil management, this is basically tillage um, um, and, and the use of uh, fertilizers and, and that type of thing. Enteric fermentation, when you take that cow, capos, you know, this is part of the greenhouse gas problems. This number varies. It depends on who you talk to. I've heard anywhere between 8 and 30 percent um, is, is our contribution to greenhouse gas emissions in agriculture. But, you know, the point is, is that it doesn't have to be that way. There's some great research out there that's just now coming to light that says, you know, there's lots of ways for us to change our way in agriculture that we can become a carbon sink. And in many respects, we can become the solution to climate change if we could only embrace change. Mm -hmm. There's some great work happening out in Cal uh, California, uh, the Marin Carbon Project. How many of you have heard of that? Yeah. It's an interesting project. Um, they're using uh, compost, quite a bit of compost, out on rangeland. And keep in mind, rangeland makes up about 40% of California. This can't be farmed. It can't be utilized for any other purpose um, in terms of crop production. It is grazable, um, but it's pretty dead soil. Did you say Colorado? California. I think you said earlier it was Colorado. No, this is California. I might have said Colorado, and if I did, Sorry. I misspoke. Yeah. Colorado has a lot of rangeland as well. I would imagine this works there. Uh, but this is Marin, um, and that is where uh, the Marin Carbon Project is currently. And right now, they're putting a lot of compost out, about 30 to 40 tons of compost per acre, which seems like an awful lot. Whew. It is. One shot deal? It's a one shot deal. It's finished compost? It's finished compost. Full of microwaves. <laughs> Full of microorganisms. Um, and it's really caused a lot of controversy. Um, one, because people don't believe the data. But you know, it's produced by Wendy Silver, UC Berkeley. She does a really nice job. And she's been out there monitoring that for the last five years. She's got a lot of great data that shows a one-time deal, and you can really jumpstart that soil. And that's what it requires. <laughs> that soil has been beat to death. I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Western Rangeland, but you know we've been set stop grazing that land for the last the last hundred years, and you know, there's no better way to drive that into the ground than set stop grazing. So it's been abused, it's been beat badly, and this is one way to kind of rejuvenate it. It seems a little drastic, um, and there are some groups that believe you can do it just with managed grazing, and I think managed grazing is clearly a part of the 
the puzzle. Um, but this might be another avenue. And <laughs> whether or not you can afford it is another thing. And so uh, I know NRCS is coming forward. They've approved it as a new EQIP practice. So as a producer, you can apply for EQIP funding to do this kind of a thing. And they're seeing some pretty dramatic changes. They're seeing improved uh, forage production, not only in yield, but also in quality, which is also kind of cool. Cover crops, we've known for a very long time that these cover crops are magnificent. Um, they do so much to feed the soil. And as Chris was pointing out, we've got a carbon deficiency problem. There's no better way to, re to, to fix that than to put cover crops um, in, keep the soil covered, and then incorporate um, some of that to feed the microbes there. A lot of data out there to suggest you know, that you know, we could actually <laughs> compensate for 8% of the direct annual greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture if we could just get our mind around applying cover crops in all situations where they might apply. And they probably apply in more places than we even think about. How about cover crops out on native ranch? People aren't thinking about that. How about no-tilling in a cover crop into the native ranch? Why not build that soil with natural rainfall and see how much progress we can make in terms of soil tilth and soil fertility just by seeding native range? We're giving it a go. We just finished seeding, so hopefully that data will be available soon. No-till, low-till, um, non-disturbance types um, operations definitely support you know, mycorrhizae. Again, not earth shattering, but it's the kind of thing that um, if you ask the average farmer in the Midwest, they say it won't work. They just, right? It won't work. It won't work because they don't like to see the weeds. They don't like to see um, the, the ramifications of a no-till transition system. I mean, with time, it can look beautiful. It can look like this, but it's going to take you some time to get there because you do have a tremendous weed seed bed, and those weed seeds are going to raise their ugly head. But <clears throat> the more we can really support these no-till systems that give us as much mycorrhizae as possible, we'll get these kinds of soils. And that's the goal, is to have soils that hold together in an aggregate, in a slate test like this, to produce a nice, clear conventional till. Every time we turn that soil, we're, we're fragmenting that soil. We're breaking up the aggregates. We're destroying the good biology that we need in order to create the glue that holds it together. Um, this uh, happens to be uh, some pasture ground. Um, and this is just a straight no-till, no-till, 10-year no-till, and then this is typical conventional ground. Obviously, this soil is going gonna, is gonna to run off. Um, in terms of water holding capacity, it's very low. It's not going to hold water, and it's going to go away uh, very quickly. So um, NRCS came up with some latest statistics on soil organic matter, which is really what we're trying to build as much as possible. For every 1% increase, we're holding another 20,000 gallons of water. At the university farm, up the ground that I've been managing for the last 12 years, we've increased soil organic matter by 2%. Could be better, but 2% is pretty good. So we're irrigating less which means that we're making a little more return because our costs are lower. Do you happen to know what an inch of rain translates into as gallons of water per acre? I'm just trying to get a sense of what that means. <laughs> oh, in terms of water? I don't know. Do we know? Yeah. I think it's about 27,000 gallons, if I remember correctly, something like that. Yeah. So 1% would capture almost a range rainfall. Thanks. Yeah. Ballpark. About 20, 20, 24, 25, yeah. What was your baseline though? Two percent over what? Two percent? Yeah, we started at about three. Yeah, and so right you now. Seventy percent increase. Yeah, it's quite nice, isn't it? Yeah. Right. Yeah, and if only we could actually get rewarded for that in some other way, then um, because I, I don't think that. Oh, that's good. I don't want a problem. That's for sure. But that is under an irrigated system, and you know, considering how much of the land surface is in rangeland. I mean, that's, I mean that's, a, that's, a, that's a challenge to us all. How is it that we're going to really address that from a regenerative ag perspective? And the West, 31% of the total land mass 
is in rangeland, and it's really home to a whole host of other uh, organisms. I mean, it's, uh, it's, a, it's very uh, rich in wildlife species and that type of thing. Um, California, about 50% of the state's land area is in rangeland and in forests. And obviously, based on just recent history, we need a more regenerative type management practice in order to make those lands more productive. Um, we, we took cattle out. Um, unfortunately, in a lot of the public land area, cattle were eliminated. And I'm not saying that they're eliminated for the wrong reason. Uh, they were eliminated because of the bad management where they were allowed to overgraze riparian areas and they were allowed to do damage in places where cattle should never have been. It doesn't mean that they can't be grazed appropriately because they certainly can. And we just need to apply that new technology to these lands and make them more productive. And we can prevent a lot of these forest fires and we can produce a lot more animal protein with the same land mass. Um, but we need to embrace change. Grazing management matters. I don't think anybody has really demonstrated that you know, better than you know, like the Safer Institute and HMI, the Holistic Management. I mean, they've shown what can happen because there's grazing and then there's grazing. And I work with a lot of dairy producers who just use their pasture as a holding facility. And that is so not what's intended. Because grass can be rocket fuel if it's managed appropriately by really paying attention to your soil and grazing it through a managed intensive grazing system, you can really make some wonderful feed. And it's actually the best feed that we produce. And it only costs us eight cents per dry matter pound. The best alfalfa that can compensate for the quality of my forage is 17 cents per dry matter pound. So from a net profitability perspective, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's definitely the way to go. So this is set stock grazing. You can see it no matter where you go. I've seen it in every country I've visited, every state I've been, I've seen people doing this. And it's, um, they just don't know what they don't know. So how do we get them to, to know this? How do, how do we get them to embrace this idea? I mean, it's really not a livestock problem, it's a people problem. And so we're really, I am so not prepared for this. Because I was trained as a, as a scientist, <coughs> animal scientist, in, a, in agronomy and in, and in agriculture. I'm not a social scientist. I don't understand psychology. And that's exactly what we need here. Those are the tools we need to address this problem. So a managed grazing system, call it whatever you want. Uh, the new term out there is adaptive multi paddock grazing they tend to use that more so out on native range we're using managed intensive grazing more on the irrigated pasture scenario either way the whole idea is that it's all on all off you know you don't stay too long and you don't come back too soon so the whole idea is to provide adequate rest and i tell you what the cattle do perform better they do perform better because they're getting better feed each and every time you turn them loose on a new piece of grass. They're getting really great grass and it's fresh and the cows know it. They can't wait to get out of the parlor to get back to the grass because they knew they just got a new allocation after every milking. And I had a question. Yeah, I've been doing this for 10 years with a small herd and I want to know if there's any suggestions you can have for how to increase the photosynthesis, the biomass production, the cow, uh, standard unit cows per acre, we're going to be able to, where can we max out at? If, if you're going to talk about Where are that. you now? How many pounds per acre are you applying at this time? Mm, I don't know. I, I don't use that unit, I don't think. Okay. Um, well, your uh, goal, if you're not there currently, 200,000 pounds per acre is a of, good goal. Of dry matter? No, 200,000 200, pounds of beef. Oh, animal, live animal I'm, per I'm, acre. I'm raising dairy. So okay. mob grazing? Yeah, mob grazing is the way to really pulse those soils. Do you, uh, and overseeding? Are you doing any kind of no till drill seeding? Not drill, just frost seeding occasionally every couple of years. If I, especially if I see changes in the sward. But I'm, these are dairy cows. You know, yep. They're actually, uh, a heritage breed, mixed breed, and that's got. I only have 15 head, 
doesn't matter how many units. units. Well, it doesn't so far as how we're going to make the paddocks. We're going to move them. I'm going to try to bomb graze, and i got to make them pretty much you know, half the size of this room for a day. That's right. Yeah. And you would. Yeah, well, I wouldn't. There's a lot of extra time. <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> yeah, that's the trade-off. I don't know how to more photosynthesis. Yeah. And in order to get more photosynthesis, you're going to have to get more chlorophyll. To get more chlorophyll, you need more leaf you know, diameter. And that means you're going to have to change the species and the density of your plants. So two ways to do that. You know, you're either going to overseed with the preferential um, species that you like. We put in eight different species and all different types. You know, we've Can got you different... talk about the eight species sure. and the broader leaves that you're going after at this point? Sure. Sure. Um, every fall we do a cool season, what yeah. we call overseeding, and so it's a no-till drill and we seed into existing pastures. So we don't till anything, mm -hmm. so it's all no-till. Mm -hmm. And we're going in there with eight different species. There's a chicory and a plantain, and we do have some brassicas mixed in there, but, you know, low. It's, you know, a pound and a half um, max per acre. So it's Daikon or, or, pardon me? Daikon, daikon radish then for brassicas? Turnip. The turnip, okay. Yeah. So we've got a turnip in there, and then we've got uh, perennial and Italian ryegrass. Yeah. We've got an Adam brome. It's kind of a hybrid yeah. type grass. And we're putting in some orchard grass, but we're kind of backing out on that because I don't like the bunchiness. Mm -hmm. You can get non-bunchy orchard grasses, but boy, I tell you what, the orchard grass loves to stay deep into that heat of the summer. Mm -hmm. um, so I can get orchard grass to grow <coughs> and I can't get my ryegrass. Ryegrass is done in July for us. May not be for you. I missed you saying where are you uh, where are you located? We're located in Northern California. So zone four, zone oh, five, five, six, six, probably zone eight. eight. Zone eight. Yeah, I think we're eight or nine because it's okay. pretty hot. Yeah. <laughs> That's Sacramento. Above Sacramento, Chico. about an hour. Chico. Mm -hmm. Just recently got a fire there. You wasn't subsoil plowing at all. For, for water. You know, we did that initially. Uh, we tried that, and um, my plantains took off after that. So I know that we do have a, a, an issue there. And I, I, I bring out people because I love having different eyes on our place. And uh, they were quite sure that we didn't have enough pounds per square per, per acre. So what we're going to try this year, uh, in addition to our seeding, and we do, we use five tons of compost every fall in order to really, um, we, we consider that a soil probiotic. Um, and. Uh, I, we tried the subsoiler, um, gosh, one time. The only problem with that subsoiler is that it really kind of tears things up. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's supposed to kind of glide through the soil and. You got a real rocky soil. Yeah, we do. Mm -hmm. So um, we had a little bit of a problem there. On native range, we've got three plots going with the yeoman's plow on two different slopes and on the flat, and we're looking at trying to reseed native range because. In the plots, just with the yeoman's plow, we saw a drop in dry matter production. We did get better water infiltration, but for whatever reason with the disturbance, I don't know, we definitely saw a drop in dry matter production, which is very strange. So um, this year we're overseeding with uh, some non-natives, their annuals. Um, we're gonna see what actually happens there, see if we can actually get some other species happen in a native range. Question the here. five tons of compost per acre? Yes, five ton per acre. Recording, aerating, and aerating the soil. And we just broadcast that just on. Broadcast, broadcast it, it on, yeah. And then the fall rains can pull, you know, that, that'll work it in. So you really don't need to work it into the soil as long as you put it in and you've got rainfall. <clears throat> Go ahead. In the back here, and then I'll come up front. Thank you. For purposes of you know, cost and efficiency, you know, do you guys ever go to anaerobic digestion, or is that too expensive as far as processing mm -hmm. the animal waste and spreading it? Our philosophy is is that you know, from a we've mitigated seventy five percent of our manure problem just by going out on grass. Mm -hmm. Those cows are out there distributing their own manure, um, and they're doing it in a very methodical way because we're managing the grazing. Mm -hmm. And so that manure is getting distributed over all the grazing acres. And the only manure that we have to compost is that that is up on the headquarter area at the time of milking. So the cows, when they come in for milking, you know, they'll, they'll be dropping manure here and there. So we scrape that up and we compost it. So that, to me, is a great way to mitigate a lot of the manure management issues. Question. Um, 
after mob grazing, do you find it necessary to reseed in, in nature? The mob comes through, buffalo come through, and sure. then it spontaneously recovers. Mm -hmm. But why the seeding? Well, in our mind, it actually helps us with the preferential species that can really drive milk production in a big way. We definitely have, and you know, none of that is native, but what it does do is it has really wonderful results in the bulk tank. So is the condition of the area after it's grazed pretty punched up and, you know, from cows, hooves and all that? Yeah. yeah, you're referring to yeah, native range where they've had a lot of animal impact, and we don't, we don't tear up our irrigated pasture because we, yeah, we keep that sod intact and you don't see the amount of animal impact in that way. We'll go in when the forage is about 15 inches and we'll graze it down to about half. And you can do that with any number of animals. It doesn't matter if you've got 15 or if you've got 50, you can still manage the grasses in that, you know, eat half, leave half kind of a phenomenon. And you can, um, you know, the, the tighter you graze them, the less selective grazing you're going to have. If you're going to allow them to have too much area, they're gonna go in there and they're gonna top it. They're gonna take your clovers and anything else that's really, really sweet. And they're gonna leave behind the stuff that they don't like so much. So if you really wanna manage your grasses to really make them um, uniform and rocket fuel, rocket fuel, you need to really manage the grazing and you need to do it pretty intensively. And what I learned this last go around from the Soil Health Academy is that I'm not grazing intensively enough there. So we're going to give it a go and we're going to try and do it a little harder. Because right now, I think we're calculated at about 150,000 pounds per acre is really what our intensity is. Yeah. So we're going to up that to 200,000 and see how well the cows do, how well they milk. Um, yeah. So when you calculate that out, and it's just a matter of changing the wire size. So it's really, I'm not changing my labor requirements at all because I'm still out there giving them fresh feed every 12 hours. Every 12 hours, after every milking, they get fresh feed. You mean a new pasture? Yeah, a new allocation. Yeah, yeah a new allocation. So they're getting fresh feed. And we try to, uh, there we go, let's see if that works. Good. The whole idea there is to, to, to give the cows uh, fresh feed every 12 hours, and um, and then you know that that to me is really where the, the milk production lies. Another question here? I guess not. I have one for you. Yeah. Are cows smart enough to, to be trained to, to go to a certain sector of the pasture rather than moving the wires, uh, laying a grid down like uh, pet owners do for dogs? <coughs> Could you actually just get them to do that and save a lot of labor. Great. <laughs> hey, that's great. I mean, you can put laser tag things on their neck and you could give that a go. You could yeah. probably do that. I mean, if you're willing to shock them with an electric fence, then you ought to be willing to shock them with a, a collar mm -hmm. like dogs have. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you're going to have to reset that uh, laser wire every time too, and I can probably reset my single um, electric wire as fast as you can reset your laser wire. I'm talking about laying down a grid in, in, in the soil one time. Hmm. I've never seen that technology, so that would be a new one. Uh, it kind of maybe cows. puts a person into a pattern that they might want to change if they adapt in the year in the future. So that's, that's one of the reasons that I really like the single strand of hot wire. Yeah. Is uh, in two years, if I've changed the whole plan, because I don't know what I'm doing, you know, which happens to me a lot. <laughs> uh, then, um, then I can say, oh great, now it's, I haven't created a permanent infrastructure that's, that I can't evolve. You may be able to do that in the future with a wireless, there are wireless systems for dogs, for the collar, with a, yeah, and then you have a bell cow, you have a bell cow that basically leads the rest of the cows, but mm -hmm. it'd be interesting. The, the cows, I mean, even with that, in, in talking, I was recently in Brandon, Manitoba, and there was a producer there who said, you know, they have sort of a checkerboard pattern that they use, similar to exactly. like that, yeah, and yeah. that um, with the single wire, mm -hmm. they have, um, you know, just now with even that, that the cows know because they, mm -hmm. you know, basically sense where mm -hmm. the, you know, they can smell where the, the fresh forage is, uh -huh. and they'll go, they'll skip over the, the paddocks where okay. they grazed in the past, and they'll go to the the 
the fresher paddocks. The way so we've got to set sort up, follow it. our wire doesn't take any more than 10 minutes to set, yeah. you know, so I guess, I don't see the amount of time it takes to set one wire, um, you know, to, to, but if, if it were, if I had a problem, you know, with my infrastructure, that might be a perfectly logical way to go. It also gets you out in the field looking at your grass. Grass, uh, is true. You know, which is really important. It is. To Will take you, a look. Go ahead. The Australian government and also a company in Norway called No Fence have been developing wow. collar technology mm -hmm. uh, that you can adjust by satellite so you don't even have to lay any sort of greater fencing down. Mm -hmm. You can just update with your iPhone where you want the animals to be. Yeah, so it's <laughs> 10 seconds instead of 10 minutes. Fascinating. Oh, man. <laughs> well, and the other thing I, I was going to say, too, I was working with a producer in Manitoba, and one of the other things that they wanted to do, which is a way in which you can utilize your cattle for, and I'm sorry, Sanum, <laughs> but um, you can utilize your cattle if you have a particular issue that you want to address, mm -hmm. where she went out there and laid single wire um, and moved them in so they really intensely grazed that one particular area where she had a, yeah. a weed management issue sure. that she wanted to address. So she got them in there in, they were in a really small paddock and then while they were there, she put the rest of the, she put, she strung the rest of the single wire in the rest of the paddock and then opened that up. And so in the time that it took her to sing, to string the rest of the wire for the larger paddock for the, because yeah. they were going to be gone for several days. And that's part of that adaptive, um, different types of grazing management that Alan Williams and Gabe Brown and, and uh, Richard Teague are all talking about that it isn't just about you know you have to move them every so many days it's it's really being more chaotic and more flexible in what you're doing good and, and that does make sense too we just need to kind of keep in mind that on the dairy end we're talking irrigated pasture which tends to be a little different ecosystem than out on native range which you know that kind of creativity really makes a lot of sense I can see that have a safe trip Susan um, I think, yeah, getting that kind of creative um, with lasers and satellites out on range would be perfect because um, on some of that, it's pretty impossible to get a lot of fence and infrastructure there. So that is kind of an interesting phenomenon. Um, this is Dr. Richard Teague. He's, uh, I think, an icon um, in, the, uh, in, in the rangeland industry. And what, uh, what, what Richard has shown is that the changing our grazing practice can really enhance soil organic matter. So you know, here are the various types of grazing practices on some very large ranches in Texas. And what they did is they looked at soil organic matter at several different levels in the soil. And it became very obvious you know, that this multi paddock system was really doing the job with respect to building soil organic matter. So it does matter how you manage the cattle. Not only that, but because we're building soil organic matter, you wonder, well, what is it doing in terms of the mycorrhizae fungi? Well, according to Richard's <coughs> data, he's seeing a lot more of the mycorrhizae as well. The total ratio of fungi to bacteria jumps up significantly, and that really backs up the David Johnson uh, philosophy. For those of you that know Dr. David Johnson out of New Mexico State University, it's his belief that really the secret to really productive soils and productive agricultural landscapes is skewing your fungal bacterial ratio. And he does it with his biologically enhanced beam uh, compost material. Um, and what Richard is doing is he's doing it with grazing practices. So in other words, there's lots of different ways to get at the same end. What is his ratio, please, of bacteria to uh, David okay. Johnson, it's five to one in his material. Right. And, and what his he's material doing, isn't all mycorrhizal fungi. No. It's, it's it's fungi and diverse. it's and it's very diverse and mm -hmm. it's more saprophytic than it is mycorrhizal. But he does inoculate with mycorrhizal fungi at a different time when he uses it on his plants. And you mean saprophytic means what is that a bacteria? It is saprophytic. It's fungi that um, are feeding off of dead material, so they're not mycorrhizal. They're not live, eat, feeding off of living plants, but he generates it in, in in a compost mixture. So in a compost mixture, you're generating because you're feeding off of 
we're breaking down dead material. The fungi you're doing are saprophytic that you're growing. And the beauty of his system is that he's experimenting now with different application rates. Um, in his experimental plots, he was using 400 pounds per acre, but he's quite sure that in Australia they're making it into a compost tea and doing you know, a spray application and getting the same results. So that's kind of an encouraging um, idea, but you know, it's all anecdotal until we actually have some data. So let's generate the data. Question? Out of context, I just want to ask you to keep the calves with the longer does that at least remove does it decrease the stress uh, which uh, species are we talking about time dairy to bring this up. Yeah. dairy cows yeah. or beef cattle dairy, dairy. yeah oh, actually. you know I've, I've seen that and the question is does it decrease the stress on the cow if we allow the calf to suck the cow for an extended period of time stay with the herd sure just stay with the herd um, you know, it's impossible for me to kind of get into the mind of the cow in that part, but uh, I'm quite sure that she likes having that cat next to her. Um, the only question is, how do you manage that in the parlor? Um, folks out in California have tried that. Uh, Brian and Christina Blasma is probably the one. They have 500 cows, and they were able to do that with the heifer calves, and they left the heifer calves on. It meant very chaotic parlor time because the calves just kind of come and go in their system. They have a herringbone uh, kind of a system, and it allowed the calves to kind of come along the front. So it worked, and they didn't notice any real serious drop in milk production, but they pulled those calves in three months, so it's not as if they allowed them to stay alongside like you would with a beef cow. Don't you measure the stress hormones of the animals? Well, you could, but it's pretty stressful measuring the stress hormones. So by the time, <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a pretty rapid response. So by the time you restrain her and collect a blood sample, you already spiked her cortisol. You know, so that's a hard one to try and track. Um, but, you know, you can do it in, in terms of behavior. And I, um, you know, they really like being with their babies. I do know that. Okay, um, this is uh, some of the newest data that's out there that's really encouraging. Um, I think in terms of, uh, uh, of regenerative grazing practices and, and uh, many of you have probably seen a lot of the data on feedlot. Um, on the feedlot data, it shows, um, yeah, this would be feedlot data that shows the net greenhouse gas flux. Um, in, in a feedlot scenario as compared you know, to a typical um, pasture-based system. Um, so, oh, an amp. So grazing's on this side, feedlot is on that side. So if you looked at that and only that, you would think that what? They're both bad. The They're feedlot bad. produces less That's feedback. That's right. Feedlot. Exactly less, right. Because the animals don't live as long. Animals don't live as long. And uh, yeah, so the, uh, the life expectancy, you know, the, the, these animals um, are, are definitely going to be, um, you know, they're going to die much quicker um, and get through the system. That's why we've got feedlots, because it's a very efficient way of making beef. On this side of the equation, what, uh, what Jason Roundtree did with his graduate student, uh, Paige Stanley, is that they actually looked at the carbon flux of the cow, beef cow, in their ecosystem. So they looked at the amount of carbon that was moving in and out of the system, going into the soil, into the grasses, into the animal, and so on. And what they found in that situation, when you actually looked at a total system, as opposed to just a snapshot, um, is that there was a net negative for the grazing system, as opposed to the feedlot situation, which those of us in agriculture kind of intuitively knew, but there were, there's no data to really back it up. And so that's what makes this study pretty exciting. What's the unit, CW? So it's kilograms CO2 per CW. Uh, per kilowatt, yeah, that's a, just a, a way to evaluate the amount of CO2 that's being um, put into the system. So Basically. they're just looking at it. So it's weight though. It's not time. It's not area. It's total carcass, carcass weight. No, CW, it's cow weight, but CW. Per kilogram of? No, no it's no, a ratio. It's Kilograms down per the side of the It's It's, it's per the... CW it's dash. kilograms of carbon per carcass weight. Carcass weight. <coughs> no. <coughs> CW. So CW would be carcass weight. Well, that's what we guess. No. That's why I'm asking. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah, that's my guess. Is car carcass weight. So that's live weight. 
No, carcass weight. Carcass weight is dead. <laughs> Live weight would Usually be live. But we're measuring off of the feedlot, so. <laughs> yeah, but the end point. We usually yeah. Don't get live weight. yeah, the end point is what we're looking at, and so yeah. I guess the end point would be when they're dead. So, so that would be kilograms of uh, CO2 uh, per kilogram of uh, carcass weight. Good? So uh, this really backs up a lot of the stuff. How many of you are familiar with Dr. Christine Jones? Good. Yeah. She has uh, really uh, done, I think, some wonderful work, um, done some, uh, a lot of talks um, throughout the country. Um, by changing grazing practices, you know, she believes we can sequester a lot of carbon. So we can definitely have an impact by changing that. So ultimately, it's layering these, uh, these production practices to kind of create this synergism that takes place. So it's, it's combining no-till and multi-species cover crops, crop rotation, compost applications. And then if you've got livestock, it's managing the grazing on top of that. And ultimately, it's called stacking practices. And that helps um, this whole process. And no one's really done that better than Gabe Brown, who has really become the poster child for regenerative practice. I mean, he stacks practices and causes cattle as soil health improvement tools, which I think is pretty clever. Um, but ultimately, you know, this is his learning curve. And if we could just get everyone on this kind of a learning curve, we'd be in pretty good shape. You know, back in 93, this is basically where he started, um, with a no-till situation. And if you ever have heard him speak, uh, what caused him to make that paradigm shift was what? Well, Disaster after disaster. Yeah. He was going broke. You know, and it really takes that kind of a cataclysmic event to get people to embrace change. And that's why we think, you know, forest changes now, forest management changes are probably key right now in California. We can, people will listen uh, to a change in forest management now <clears throat> since we've had this cataclysmic event, um, you know, trying to make a little lemonade out of lemons. But this was uh, Gabe's. Um, Paradigm shifting event. He was going broke in '93. He started out with a 1.7% organic matter, which is a, a pretty poor soil, which is pretty dead. Chris, is that pretty typical of that part of the world? Um, it is now. It, <laughs> it shouldn't be, All right? But it is now. Yes. So his um, his progression through this 2013, where he actually has um, enhanced the number of different crops, he's. He did, uh, he, he was switching around cash crops, he started to do cover crops, he was doing more multi-species kinds of things to add more diversity. He extended his growing season, improved his water holding capacity, and you can see the, the idea behind this, this diagram is that you see the change in his soil organic matter over time from, from this kind of uh, orange material to this nice deep rich brown, <coughs> cake-like. Um, <coughs> material that looks like cottage cheese. Um, and he's, he admits that it isn't everywhere on his ranch, but to make that kind of progress is pretty amazing. The fact that he has got water holding capacity um, at the level that he does, I think he can hold like 10, 12 inches of, of rainfall, which is pretty amazing. Uh, and Gabe introduced me to this guy. Um, um, th this particular scientist, also studied stacking practices to some degree. You know, it, it, in his work, he believed that the no-till system was providing um, a lot more carbon storage than a regular tillage. But when he added um, uh, these cover crops into the system, he was getting 64% more um, uh, carbon stored in his system. And it, it's his belief that you, even in a two inch rainfall, you can still grow cover crops. So you're never in an ecosystem where you really can't make these things work. Two inches of rainfall, you can make cover crops work. You know, why can't we make that work in California rangeland is my thought. So that's what we're gonna give it a try. We're gonna give it a go and see what happens. Richard Teague in, um, published an article also on stacking practice and, and the importance of livestock. I mean, we often get that blowback that livestock really aren't regenerative when in fact they are and can be. And it's really about the management aspects. Um, and there's plenty of data to back it up. Livestock can be a regenerative tool. And they do produce, you know, a valuable um, product in the end, whether they're a land restoration tool or if it's um, animal protein. 
But this, uh, the, the crux of the story in this particular journal article that Richard produced is that, you know, this is kind of where we are in production agriculture. We're a net emitter. So this would be the net greenhouse gas emissions in gigaton. So, and then as we move to a more regenerative type system, this number two is where we've got current agriculture with about 50% of the current ruminants. So we're going to pull out half of them. So for those people who believe that livestock are a detriment and the scourge of the planet, let's take 50% of them away. And according to his models, it really isn't helping us out with, with greenhouse gas emissions. So in scenario three, 25% conservation cropping systems and adaptive grazing um, with the current ruminant numbers here. So that's just 25% adaptation rate for production agriculture. Just 25% of us doing cover crops and um, no-till and uh, amp grazing, and we're a net sink. So this fourth scenario is at 50%, and this <coughs> fifth one is at 100% conservation cropping system and amp grazing with the current numbers that we have. So according to his models, and this is Richard's deal, I mean, these are his numbers. Um, it's apparent that you know we can really have an impact on um, climate change if those of us in agriculture could really embrace this new way of production. So this is where I'm going to kind of move away from this whole climate change phenomenon and kind of talk a little bit about where this grass-fed um, animal fits from a nutritive um, kind of <laughs> scenario. Um, in 2010, uh, we put together a 30-year summary of all grass-fed beef research because it needed to be done. We were being asked all the time. And we were right in the middle of collecting some grass-fed beef data. We do a lot of uh, lipid work, in particular <coughs> in these different feeding regimes. And we standardized it down to one cut, so we only looked at that of the, the data that um, reported loin eyes, and we standardized it to um, one particular class of animal at 20 to 30 months of age. And it's not as if, you know, this is a, is, is a brand new phenomenon. I mean, we were looking at uh, carotenoids and different nutrient content of animal proteins since, you know, 1916. So there is a lot of data there if one chooses to look for it. Um, here is um, the summary of our comparisons. Um, in our uh, analysis, when we looked at grass-fed versus grain-fed in the literature, um, overall, there really isn't any difference in, in the overall saturated fat content between the two. People were surprised by that, but it's pretty <coughs> consistent through the literature. But what is different is the ratio of the individual saturated fats. How many of you have a really bad sense for saturated fats? Feel like they're bad? Not in this group. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's great. That's awesome, actually. Um, I don't get that, typically. What we did was we looked at the individual saturated fatty acids to see if there was a difference, and there definitely is a big difference. So we looked at C18, 16, and 14. 14 and 16 are the shorter saturated fats. They're the ones that are tend to be associated with elevating your, your low-density lipoproteins. Whereas C18 is net neutral. It has no effect um, on your low-density lipoproteins. And in the grass-fed samples, there was a much higher ratio of C18 to the other saturated fatty acids um, within the pool of the saturated fats. So what that means is that of the saturated fats in grass-fed, a higher proportion are in that individual saturated fatty acid that has no effect on LDL. Whereas the grain fed tends to have a higher proportion of those saturated fatty acids that do elevate low density lipoprotein. We looked at the omega 6 to omega 3 ratio. You know, we want um, a pretty um, low ratio there, the lower the better, so that we have um, um, that improves um, heart health and a whole host of other type of health uh, parameters. Uh, we looked specifically at the amount of omega-6 and then the amount of omega-3 and then looked at that ratio. And what we're seeing is that there isn't a really a big difference in the omega-6. Where the big difference occurred is in the amount of omega-3. 
And because the omega-3 was so much higher in the grass-fed, it skewed that ratio. And so it gave the grass-fed a better omega-6 to 3 ratio. That's huge because, you know, you're competing against seafood, mm -hmm. and it really positions beef to be much more valuable in people's diets going forward. It does, actually. It's just a, you know, historically, grass-fed beef doesn't taste as good as grain-fed beef. And when I was living in Hawaii, and they introduced it through Safeway, then people, you know, ran. They couldn't believe how tasty it was with all the marbling and everything. Mm -hmm. It was a huge contrast. And of course, you know, things change. And maybe at this point, because people are focused on growing grass-fed beef and they're making it more nutritious, it's coming to a point where it's getting more people. Right. Yeah, it's really wonderful. Good. Um, diet has a big impact um, on, on um, the lipid um, makeup of, of the beef. So this is a study that was actually done um, by uh, Susan Duckett. Um, back in 93, but what I love about this one is that it's pretty clear and what it shows is it's the same class of animals and they were just fed these different diets. Here's a grass-fed diet, here's one that contains you know, a pretty high amount of concentrate, so this would be a grain. And the N3 fatty acids jump up dramatically in the grass-only um, diet. And you can see here that you know, based on um, our data, looking at all this literature over the last 30 years, we didn't see a big change in N6, and that's pretty consistent with what um, Susan is showing here. So we do skew this N6 to N3 ratio primarily by elevating the amount of omega-3. So this leads me to my friends in the feedlot industry that said, okay, well, my cattle are only on grain for the last 60 days. Mm -hmm. So in other words, they're on a grass-fed diet all of their life with the exception of the last 60 days. So what happens to the lipid profile after that? <coughs> well, what happens after three months is that you basically drop the omega-3 because there is a remodeling that takes place in those lipid pools um, to the point where it's a grain-fed product um, pretty quickly. So if you really, truly want high omega-3s, you know, you're, you're going to have to um, process those animals off grass. That's the, that's the way to do it. The highest amount of omega-3 is to actually harvest animals off grass. Omega-3, we all know and love it, um, kind of, we identified it in the Eskimos, and you know we just couldn't get over the fact that you know they had a really high fat diet, a really high fat diet, and they had much lower heart disease and arthritis than we had. And once they dug into their diet and really studied it, they figured out that yeah, it was because you know they were eating a lot of omega-3, uh, a lot of omega-3 in whale fat. And from a health perspective, there are just tons of data that shows how beneficial omega-3 is to human health. It certainly is beneficial to you know, age-related memory loss, um, Alzheimer's, inflammation, it induces tumor development. I mean, it's a pretty potent um, lipid when you look at it from, from that perspective. The omega-6 to 3 ratio has always been important. I know the nutritionists have been telling us for a long time that we need to be living, we need to be consuming a ratio closer to this one to one. Uh, current dietary habits appear to be this 20 to 1, so we've really got that skewed in the American diet. And, you know, if we can get that down to the 2 to 4 to 1 that we're kind of seeing in that grass-fed beef lipid ratio, we're in pretty good shape. Here is the transvicinic acid and CLA, conjugated linoleic acid differences in the grass-fed versus the grain-fed literature. So, um, everybody know what CLA is? No. A potent antioxidant. It's a very potent antioxidant. So is TVA, a transvicinic acid, again, found by Susan Duckett, um, Columbia. She uh, identified that where a lot of people just kind of overlooked it. Transvicinic acid is actually biohydrogenated into CLA in the body itself, in the tissue. So when we see TVA, um, it's actually um, future CLA. So you can consume it as TVA, and then your body will actually convert it into CLA, so it's basically CLA and waiting. 
um, which is interesting. And we do have a lot of TDA. TDA actually um, is at a higher concentration than CLA, um, in, uh, even in grass-fed. It's about the same ratio in grain-fed, but significantly higher in grass-fed. Conjugated linoleic acid was really first founded in the 80s. Michael Pariza kind of came out in literature. I'm really surprised more of you grass-fed folks don't know that because it's a real selling point when you think about it. Um, he was actually looking for the reason why um, people associated uh, meat consumption with colon cancer. It was his hypothesis that you know this meat extract um, that would be fed to these cells and in this case, mouse epidural tumor cells, would actually cause those tumor cells to proliferate. So he was extracting the fat from hamburger, and he was inoculating his epidermal tumor cells. And what he found was just the opposite of what he intended. And um, when he got to the bottom of it, um, he discovered CLA, and that CLA was actually inhibiting the growth of these tumor cells, and that it wasn't actually deactivated by heat. So you could cook the hamburger, take the fat extract from the hamburger and purify it, you know, so, and, and then feed it to these uh, tumor cells. And he found that it actually had a tumor inhibitory type impact, which is pretty cool. And there's lots of different types of CLA. Uh, there's lots of what we call isomers of, and this one happens to be the most active and it's also the most prevalent in grass-fed beef. It's the the cis-9 translative. That just basically said that there's really two double bonds uh, there that kind of give it a special kink, and it's that really that, that 3D structure that makes it biologically active. So where those bonds occur are important, and that's a really active one, the 9 cis-11 trans, team two. Um, lots of research there done by um, a Dr. Ivett Roswell, Park Cancer Institute. Um, he published back in the 90s on the effect of CLA, particularly with respect to cancer. And it's been corroborated in many other laboratories, so this isn't exactly earth shattering news. Um, so much so that the National Academy of Sciences concluded that <coughs> conjugated linoleic acid is the only fatty acid shown unequivocally to inhibit carcinogenesis in external animals. So that's a pretty good. That's a strong endorsement. Statement. Yeah. It is. It's good news. Mm -hmm. British Journal of Cancer um, published 1994 an article where they looked at women. Women with the most ALA, which is the precursor, that's the alpha linoleic acid, is a precursor to CLA in their diets were 25% less likely to have breast cancer return as compared to women who had the least amount of ALA in their diet. So, uh, and then, it, yeah, this keeps going. There's, there's a lot more than just this. This, this CLA, this was another um, American Journal of Clinical Nutrition that showed CLA in adipose tissue reduced the risk of myocardial infarction. Um, and they also, in this article, mentioned that you can get a lot more CLA out of grass-fed dairy products and that that would lead to a more healthful outcome. It does suppress type 2 diabetes. Um, that's also been shown. Uh, first, it was shown um, by uh, uh, Dr. Um, Lurie out of Northwest Hospital in Seattle, Washington, and Purdue. And it's been also collaborated in other places. So um, lots of good news in terms of CLA. It's just found in, in different parts of the animal, like brain, the liver. It's just found in the fat. <coughs> yeah. It's found in the fat. So you want high marble. Yeah. yeah. That's correct. And so all of these results that I'm reporting are you know, grams per, per 100 grams of lipid. So they're, they're based on the amount of lipid that's there. So if you're looking at that, then you know, that, you know, the more lipid, the, the better um, with respect to these really beneficial antioxidants that we're talking about. And carotenoids are, are no different. Carotenoids are like beta carotene. Um, the data that we uh, put together, these are the three studies that were the best with respect to their evaluation of beta carotene that met our criteria for muscle tissue that were being compared. And there was a pretty dramatic increase in the amount of beta carotene um, that's in grass fed fat versus grain fed fat. Vitamin E, same way, that's been measured more extensively. You know, these are six different studies that look specifically at that. 
um, within this uh, the longissimus dorsi muscle that we were looking at in particular, and it's a pretty stark um, contrast. So vitamin E significantly improved in grass-fed type meat. So it's pretty clear that's what, but does it really matter what they're eating? It, and it does. This article in the Republic Journal for Agrobiology looked at the various different forms of forages. Here we've got natural mountain grassland. Here we've got um, a, a trifolium, and um, this is a permanent grass, uh, some kind of a fescue combination. Uh, this is a chicory and a plantain. This is a covered uh, clover grass mixture. And then this would be uh, a <coughs> mixture. And, and I guess the point is this. They vary in terms of the carotenoid content on a dry matter basis in these fresh forages. So what you feed them, what you see, and what you have in your pastures are going to have an impact on the amount of beta carotene that's in your final product. So if you're really interested in promoting and enhancing the amount of beta carotene in your grass-fed beef, then you need to be cognizant of the types of forages that you have them grazing on. Do you also run that across through through the winter time when they they have to be fed through hay hay bales? Yeah, and and when you do that, it's going to drop because any of the hay or the processed, and I'll look at that. I've got a slide on that. Uh, that's going to definitely reduce the amount of beta carotene that's in that forage that the animals are eating. The only way to optimize beta carotene in any of the carotenoids is through lush green pasture. Anytime you harvest it, you ensile it, you uh, hay it, you lose it because it, it decomposes pretty rapidly. Well, that sort of limits you to all season grazing. It does. And when that, in the east, we don't have that option. Or you just kill, make sure you do your timing and kill off, I don't mean to kill, I shouldn't say that, we harvest um, off of your best grass. So you'd have to time it in that way and you wouldn't be able to supply fresh beef year round, but you definitely could provide really high beta carotene one time a year off your best pastures, if you follow what I'm saying. So it looks like a lot of the things there are related to um, benefits for the eyes for a human being. Mm -hmm. um, and with what the, he was saying about a comment uh, about creating the most nutrition, then would it be possible that a ranch as large as a Parker ranch on the Big Island of Hawaii would have the most potential for producing the highest nutrient value? Anywhere where they've got year-round rainfall or a year-round growing season, they have a leg up on the grass-fed market because they can provide lush green pastures year-round. I don't know if I helped you out or not. Yes, you did. Um, for, but it's true. I can only tell you, you know, what the data um, says. Uh, forage processing, yeah, that's going to damage your carotenoids. As a matter of fact, uh, we went to a lot of trouble to try and, and evaluate the carotenoids in the different varieties of, of species that we had on our study. And we had to put it on dry ice in order to get it to the lab in time to really do it because otherwise when you cut those grasses, the, the carotenoids just uh, um, metabolize, they fall apart, they degrade. Um, and that's basically what this is showing. Um, this column is as close to fresh as we can get. This is grass silage that's unwilted, you know, so it's, um, and, and it's at a, Basically, that's the beta carotene content. Here's some more carotenoids. These are all different types of carotenoids, even though beta carotene is obviously a very, very potent one. Once you get into maize silage, that's corn silage. Look at the difference there. Corn silage is not going to give you the same amount of beta carotene or uh, carotenoids or bioflavonoids for that matter. So, from a, a, a micronutrient perspective, you know you can't. You can't feed corn silage and think you're going to um, elevate or benefit your grass-fed product. Hay the same way. I mean, look at what happens to your beta carotene in hay. Why? Because it's cut, it's dried, it's cured, and the beta carotene is gone. So there is no uh, vitamin A there. Um, look, it kind of stays around. I think it's just a little more durable, but when you look at the contrast between the fresh cut 250 and the hay, it's only 18. So you can see what happens when you process um, or um, try to harvest um, your grasses. You're not going to maintain the same level of micronutrients that you had in lush green forage. 
So here's the seasonality aspects of it. It varies greatly with the season, and it also varies greatly with the elevation. So the higher you get, you're actually getting some changes there. So <clears throat> where are they located? Well, they're located in the leaf. So if you look at the amount of uh, vitamin E, for example, it's found in the leaf um, of, of these plants. Uh, so it's, uh, that's where you're going to find it. And uh, you're going to have to do it in a way that um, you can optimize the amount of beta carotene in your forages at the point in time that you harvest the animal. Um, this is just an indication of where the CLA, um, some of the CLA, if you're not taking it in as CLA directly, you're going to be taking it in as precursors of the C18 tube that gets converted to CLA in the rumen. There are microbes in the rumen that make that conversion for the cow. Um, and the same thing is true for transvicinic acid into CLA, ultimately that happens in the rumen, but it can also happen. There's an enzyme called delta-9 saturase that occurs in the mammary gland that also makes that transition. So there is some endogenous production of CLA. It's not just a matter of how much they're taking in. It's also how much precursor they're taking in. So our study, we looked at, um, we took our dairy cow herd, um, and that was during the grazing season, and we split them into four groups. We had our 100% dry matter intake off grass, so that's all they got was, was, was grass. And then we had our 70%, 30%, and then no grass at all. And then we looked at the differences in, um, in CLA, and transvicinic acid, and wow, um, transvicinic acid is right up there. Um, and we did see a dose response. So clearly the more grass you get into them, the higher the antioxidant content of your beef. I have a quick question on this slide. So the zero dry matter was 100% grain? No, it was forages, like hay and silage. Oh, and just, like not that. just not just pasture. Just not pasture. Just not getting out on grass. Not, no grass. Okay. okay yeah. yeah. Yes? Any studies being done to correlate this to like buffalo and pneumatic? Like animals that actually get the well, uh, you know, I haven't done it in buffalo, and I haven't. Uh, there, there are studies that have shown it in buffalo, um, but they are ruminant. I would imagine that they're very similar. I don't know that they biohydrogenate the same way that a dairy cow would or a beef cow would. I mean, that that work would have to be done. But they are ruminant. I'm thinking that they're going to be somewhat similar, although I don't know that for sure. What's the unit on the bottom there? Percentages or grams or what? Yeah, you know, that's going to be the amount of, um, and that's going to be gram per 100 gram of lipid. We do a little bit of the testing that you're describing on pork. So we'll do various groups of pigs that are either full grain on pasture, and then sometimes we'll put them on cover crops, and then sometimes we'll restrict their grain. And we'll take all of that and we'll send it to Susan Duckett uh, to test it for all that stuff. And we've never got to beta carotenes and everything with this last couple of years we've done uh, omega-3 to omega-6 ratios and we've done the CLA thing. And uh, just we found the same thing with the omega-3s. The, the more grass that we can give the pig to eat, the way we incentivize grass consumption is by doing uh, you know, the really lush, green, multi-species cover crops that are usually given to dairy cows. Right. If we can graze pigs through that, we can make their, uh, their omega-3s <coughs> just Whoa. Um, but uh, it doesn't do anything for the CLAs. Mm -hmm. It doesn't. No. They can't biohydrogenate, I guess. No, guessing. they can't. Mm -hmm. uh, and the way that we could do that is by giving them uh, a milk supplement, a full fat milk supplement, to act as a vehicle for moving CLAs from a ruminant into a non ruminant. You need grass fed milk? Yes. So if you had some kind of <laughs> if you live close to a cheese house, for example. Right. Yeah. Does it have to be whole milk or just the way? Yeah, the more fat that you have, the more the pig likes it, and then also the more uh, CLA you can move into the animal. What breed of pigs? Uh, I raised the uh, Heinz 57. <laughs> a mix of every pig known, and then we just select for performance. Okay. Yeah. Large blacks are hard. Okay. Good. Thank you. Uh, the beta carotene in our study looked, looked uh, you know, very similar to the CLA in terms of its overall content. And I think uh, a real important thing when we went through the literature on this, um, 
for every 100 milligrams per milliliter increase in this serum or retinol or vitamin A in the dairy cow, it's associated with 60% reduction in risk of early lactation or clinical mastitis. So, you know, this really benefits, you know, not only the milk that the human is, is consuming, but it, it's also great for the cow. And, you know, from my perspective, we've got an organic herd, we don't have a lot of tools, so it's really nice to kind of build in that strong immune system and antioxidant content in her diet, so we have less, less illness. We did look at gluten, and that kind of, it, it followed the same um, situation, and we feel like we could probably embellish um, that somewhat um, by changing to a red clover, which we don't have in our stores, we don't have that in our pastures at the moment. Uh, Tocopherol was significantly higher by treatment group, and, and clearly the more vitamin E we get into the dairy cow ration, the better. For every one microgram per milliliter increase in a vitamin E, we're seeing a reduction um, of 20% in retained placenta. So that's pretty remarkable. In regards to mastitis, I, I heard recently that the USDA has a certain acceptable level of blood and infectious agents inside the milk it's acceptable to be sold. Mm -hmm. And so that was a direct correlation to what that just showed in that previous slide, right? Is this all true? Sure, yeah. Nationally, it's 750,000 somatic cell is kind of what the threshold is, and there's zero tolerance for blood. Uh, oh. But you can't have any more than 750,000 somatic cells. Somatic cell is an indicator of uh, mammary gland um, inflammation. Mastitis. Mastitis. Yeah, yeah, subclinical mastitis. It could be clinical, but it's usually at 750,000 is subclinical mastitis. But at that point in time, it's no longer grade A. You can't you can't use it uh, for human fluid milk. Much low, lower incidence of that in organic. It is. Right, yeah, we're seeing some pretty uh, remarkable numbers there um, with respect to uh, uh, yeah, the milk quality factors. Here's some egg data. Um, this is an R data. Um, it was published in Renewable Ag and Food Science. You can see that, you know, based on a pasture-based or cage um, hen, it's going to dramatically impact the overall product. Um, you can see the N6 to N3 ratio is significantly um, improved um, here with the omega egg. They call it the omega egg. And that's basically because we're elevating again the N3 and, uh, and omega-6 stays the same. Doesn't matter. Um, what you are doing is you're elevating the omega-3 in, in that animal. And you're also elevating um, vitamin A. And you can always tell, you know, the pasture-based eggs, it's always kind of uh, a surprise. It's a little bit like, um, uh, what's that Tom Hanks movie where he opens up a box of chocolates and you never know what you get? I feel the same way when I pull uh, a dozen Forrest eggs. Gump. <laughs> Forrest Gump, thanks. When you open up an egg, you know, that's supposedly organic or, or pasture raised, you can always tell. You can always tell. It depends on how deep orange it is and how high that albumin sits, um, you know, just whether or not it's truly yes. a pasture based egg or not. Yeah. Um, so they really can't fake that. Oh. I just well, actually want to say that they can fake it. So on a consumer level, please be careful. Part of the transition of my food was I was working for a feed company mm -hmm. as a consultant on the business side, not the food side. And I went to um, I went to Minnesota to Cargill and yes. went to their poultry farm. And I had there were thirty other probably feed managers there, and the person that um, toured us showed us like these paint strips basically of colors of the shell colors and the yolk colors that they can make them by additives that they feed in that feed. And so that, the, and he literally said, so that someone who wants a brown egg, I can charge 25 cents more if it doesn't. And I looked around the room and I raised my hand and I was like, at what point did we stop talking about the nutrition of that egg? And every, I, was like, I thought I was gonna get sucked out of the room. <laughs> and I left, I flew home and I quit my job. I was like, I cannot be part of this. Mm. So they can fake it. Yeah. So make sure you That's really tragic. That absolutely like changing for me. Well, along those lines, <laughs> it's actually a pretty good segue. Um, grass fed verification programs. You know, I, because I kind of deal in this, I get asked all the time, you know, if you really wanted to know a true grass fed kind of a product, what would you need to do? Well, you can build an index fairly easily. And, you know, by basically looking at beta-carotene, the CLA, the TVA, and the omega-3, if you build your index 
from that and you do a visual assessment of the ranch that it came from could verify that they actually have enough acreage for the inventory so you'd look at the stocking rate all you really need to know is stocking rate per se and uh, you know you'd need some kind of a visual assessment of their grazing records so they would have to be on some kind of a managed intensive grazing system of some type you could verify true uh, grass-fed um, systems from non-grass-fed systems in that way we recently put on some trainings uh, for California Department of Food and Agriculture at the University of Dairy for their dairy inspectors because it's become very obvious um, that um, there are some dairies out in the West that aren't complying with pasture rule. So in order to help um, some of those folks who probably don't know a lot about dairy, um, we brought them onto the campus dairy and we trained them on what to look for for a pasture-based system. And uh, I think you know, the same thing could be true for grass-fed verification programs. You, know, you just have to train your inspectors to, to know what to look for. Some of the biggest concerns that we have with grass-fed is the fact that it is a very different lipid profile. And the American public is pretty much used to grain-fed beef. It's a very sweet-tasting, very different lipid profile. If you were raised in Argentina, grass-fed tastes like home to you. But if you were raised in Illinois or if you were raised in the Midwest, a grain-fed beef product is what you're used to. So you are going to have to familiarize your customer with a very different flavor profile, especially if you're <coughs> harvesting off of really lush grass because that lipid is going to be yellow with any luck. Mm -hmm. um, with any luck at all, your lipids are going to be yellow. And that's your proof that you've got a grass-fed product. Um, and because of that, it's going to have a very different um, uh, thermal um, cooking quality to it. Um, many people say that you just need to cook it faster. Is that your experience? What do you say? No, yes. Anybody cook a lot of grass-fed beef in this room? Mm -hmm. Yeah. We, we don't cook it much. Yeah. Okay, great. yeah. But hotter, fast. faster. Yeah. And uh, so that you really don't want to burn off all those lipids. You want to try and sear it to keep the juice in. Yeah, I think the Neiman book on cooking grass-fed beef said um, sear it, but then use a lower temperature and don't and leave it always pink. See, so you're cooking it less. Mm -hmm. I think. And I, I try. You like it? Yeah. Mm. I yeah. Well, I was raised on grain-fed beef, so it took me a little while to figure it out. <laughs> the other issue is the fact that here in the U.S., we have got meatpacking facilities that are really geared around a grain-fed product. So it's got a really nice, thick, fat cover on it. And uh, they put them through pretty quickly. Um, so it's very, very fast. The animal is you know, into the cooler almost immediately. And uh, with a uh, grass-fed product, they tend to have less exterior fat cover. Um, and I know that the genetics are changing pretty rapidly there, and you know, you're kind of working towards a more um, um, smaller animal that actually has a lower mature weight, um, and, and that would be beneficial. Um, but if you try to put a grass-fed product through an IBP or a Monford kill plant, you're going to end up with cold shortening on those cattle because you know, they're not going to have any insulation. And that cold shortening causes some toughness to it. What is that? That's when the muscle fibers start to contract. It's a slow cool is what you need. And so a lot of folks would recommend shrouding that beef, so putting a shroud around it so that it cools more slowly. And, and you can avoid cold shortening um, in that way. Or you know, find uh, an abattoir that's willing to work with you on your grass-fed <laughs> beef product and, and not try to cool it down so rapidly. Do you, do you know how much cover or how little cover that occurs, you know, quarter of an inch? You know, it's I, no doubt it's in the literature and it's gonna probably depend. Um, so I don't have that number off the top of my head, but you know, most cattle are gonna have a bark on them. And you know- Well, grain, grain, grain for correct. cattle. That's correct. Have a bark on them. But right. grass, but unless you have it go 30 plus, right. doesn't have a bark. Typically do not, that's correct. correct. So I think if you're, you know, if you're a quarter inch or below, you really need to be shrouded. Or yeah. Okay. And there are some places that still shroud. 
Um, health benefits, you know, to try and take advantage of all these wonderful micronutrients, you know, places like the, the ketchup industry um, have put lycopene on their label, but we can't do that with meat, milk, and eggs because we are regulated through the USDA, not the FDA. So that makes it a little more difficult, and they don't really recognize any of these things as nutrients, per se. Um, CLA is not considered a nutrient, even though the literature is just packed with great information about how wonderful it is for human nutrition. Omega-3 is the newest one that they do recognize. You can put omega-3 on your label, but you can't say it's high in omega-3. You can't say it's elevated omega-3. All you can do is tell them how much omega-3 per three ounce serving. That's what you can do. Hmm. Uh, I must advise a company that decided to change their product from a, a retail product to a nutritional supplement. They literally called their bottle of tea a nutritional supplement. Has so anyone you know, done that jujitsu on me? That's interesting. No, I haven't heard of that. That's an interesting approach. And, and in that situation, that would fall under the FDA. Has anybody yeah. else heard of anybody doing that? Good. Was well, it selling your, your meat as a nutritional supplement? Yep. Yeah, that's what that's you said. the idea. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I've heard some uh, grass-fed uh, uh, raw milk producers selling their milk as dog food, too. So I think that's why we have to around. Right. Sidestepping the regulations. Sidestepping the regulations, and there's lots of it. So, you know, basically, um, you know, this, this whole grass-fed phenomenon really does support a regenerative farming practice. It can be a part of a regenerative system. And uh, you know, really, all we need to do, each of us, that 2%, I've already done my 2%, now you guys have to do uh -huh. yours. You just need 2%, and you know, we can be part of the solution uh, to the greenhouse gas emissions, according to Dr. Bertan Hall. Um, Ohio State, and if anybody knows, it would be uh, Dr. Wall. So, you know, you get to eat for the good of your health and also eat for the good of the planet, and we need to create this ripple effect and shift this paradigm and figure out how we move it forward. So with that, uh, I've been taking questions right along, and I know we're after hours and we're probably hungry, uh, but if you have any questions, I'm going to stick around for a little while here, and uh, thank you very much for your time.